Well, welcome everybody to the Merging Technology Subworkgroup call. Uh, we have a very special guest today from Mayo Clinic, Jared Stahl, Senior Director at Mayo. Uh, he helped present a really wonderful um, uh, session at the Weedy Conference, Fall Conference, and uh, it was sharing AI and uh, with uh, HCSC and United Health and Mayo was up there sharing some of the unique uh, approaches that they've made. Uh, and Jared, uh, there's several different use cases that you described that I thought was just outstanding. So was, I'm really uh, quite grateful that you're here today with us. Uh, just for the audience, um, I'd like the conversation to be uh, interactive. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll let Jared go ahead and give his presentation at the beginning, and then we'll follow up and I'll help moderate discussions and this is not only chat, this is actually live conversation. So just raise your hand when we're ready to have the moderated discussion. I'll call you out and you're welcome to uh, go off mute to talk. Or if you're a little shy, you're more than welcome to chat. We're all friendly here. Uh, I, I always like to say at our Weedy work group meetings, uh, we're good to each other and we're supportive of each other. So no matter what we say, uh, we'll support you. Okay, so Jared, uh, we're anxious to hear about your uh, uh, AI um, experiences over at Mayo. Absolutely. Well, I'll start off just with a brief introduction for everybody and uh, just say hello. Um, so I, I have been with Mayo for the last three years, and I'm a senior director serving in the RevCycle automation and AI space. Uh, I also currently serve the enterprise automation efforts uh, for Mayo Clinic in an advisory capacity. Um, I have served in the healthcare provider space for the last 17 years in various analytics and AI designations. Uh, it's been an honor to do so at the Mayo Clinic for the last three years. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. So over our three-year journey in the administrative space, um, it's really been productive. Uh, we've we've really aimed towards creating innovative solutions that accelerate revenue, driving it faster to the bottom line, uh, retiring multi-million dollar vendor contracts with our own creative designs, uh, moving a lot of that cognitive work to the background, and pushing polished insight requiring human judgment to the foreground. And that's really what Mayo is all about, is pushing that envelope for what is possible. Comparatively, in, in numerous scenarios, we find ourselves operating within an environment where clinicians are often limited to a subset or finite list of options uh, with certain workflows or digital systems. Um, and these technologies, uh, things like robotic process automation combined with AI uh, to produce intelligent automation, also integrating with generative AI to promote input and then acting upon that input really serve as catalysts for expanding opportunities beyond the uh, conventional best practices. And it really propels us towards a distinctive realm within our own category, offering a greater range of possibilities. And on our journey in the automation space, we continue to observe more and more of those opportunities to harmonize our solutions with our workforce. Um, evaluating, preparing, detecting, and running those elements once again of workflow in the background, only really truly reserving those cognitive-based work uh, where human judgment is needed. And of course, in healthcare required uh, for various levels of skill and specialty. Um, we really continuously seek to create those digital bridges over gaps to solve those problems holistically. Um, we don't like to stop our progress based on the con confines of a particular system. Uh, we look to exist outside of that in our solutioning mindset. So, I mean, the objective really is simple to elevate that work that we do um, and empower our workforce to continue to thrive at the top of their specialty. Uh, so one of the use cases that I could start with, um, and maybe I'll just start also by unpacking a little bit of, of what's in our ecosystem and what is in our toolbox. And so you look at some of these terms in the industry in terms of robotic process automation, generative AI, intelligent automation, and OCR, NLP, 
Um, we have a lot of these capabilities uh, with various technology providers that we can use to implement. If I start with one of the examples in intelligent automation, um, we use a, a process um, within our revenue cycle domain uh, to essentially look at a lot of areas where we can execute on document processing. Uh, so one of the examples that we've had focus on is in prior auth. Um, the healthcare industry is deluged with different layers of document processing, so no exception in a lot of different spaces. Um, and one of our primary focuses is sort of the test use case uh, was in the RevCycle space from a prior auth perspective, where essentially we begin by using optical character recognition to read and translate documentation um, and then execute upon it using RPA to either serve it up to an individual for review and submission, or if we have different varying degrees of confidence in our models, we would promote that into our EMR in the respective area where it needs to be placed which would then trigger other workflow actions automatically um, versus you know, the traditional manual sense uh, that we would experience in the legacy workflow. So, um, and I'll pause there for questions. That's my first use case. Um, uh, Jared, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Sure. With the, um, you know, with the pending uh, rule that's gonna be coming out with uh, prior authorization and fire. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption that you'll be running your intelligent automation in front of that process, and that you would then plan to feed the CRD where you're asking for. Is it really required? Is that is that is, is that some of your your focus? Absolutely, and I think that's a great point. Um, you know, we in the automation space, automation is such a loaded phrase now, right? We have the automation capabilities in a lot of the megalithic systems that we own. Um, and we also have the opportunities in the intelligent automation space, the generative AI space. Um, and then we also look at automation in the form of creating different bridges in, 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 this, in the sense through API connections. Um, and so we have a lot of those connections uh, set up as well, like uh, through different third-party vendors or direct connections with payers. And so absolutely, I think that's part of our strategy to layer that in uh, to, to answer your question there, Ed. Okay. And maybe a follow-on. Uh, I'll, I'll, gosh, I'll shout myself. Uh, machine learning. Uh, I, I was wondering if you're taking some of the feedback from different payers and learning from uh, their decision process. Uh, to be able to you know, also help uh, aid that process. Is that is that something you're thinking about doing or already doing? We are. So we had a recent machine learning exercise, which actually got published um, recently this year, earlier this year, um, not in the denial space, but actually in the coding space. So yeah. we were looking at ED coding um, and essentially um, determining if if our outcomes were correct, if they were being, uh, what's the rate of, of the corrections coming from the provider, um, you know, and other, other different scenarios and kind of looking there from that point to see, uh, is there an opportunity with the machine learning model to automate some of that? Um, so we have, we have experimented with it in that domain, um, not in the claim status domain yet though. Okay, thank you. Uh, if anyone else has a question, uh, Jared took a pause. If anyone else has a question related to this use case, feel free to raise your hand. All right, Jared, we're ready for the next one. Okay, so use case number two, um, and this goes into a couple of different uh, spaces, but I'll I'll start with with the first one. Um, when we look at automation and we look at the capabilities that we have in, in a large health system, um, you can typically make the assumption that they have a fairly robust EMR uh, in, in a lot of cases. And so when we look about look at those opportunities to create bridges and create um, ways to fill those gaps where we see an optimized workflow, um, but there's still a lot of clicks or there's still a lot of manual touches or some type of outside preparation that needs to take place, um, even in the best case scenario, 
uh, in your workflow. Um, and so one of those examples is uh, document preparation. So we'll, we'll see end users in, in the case of sending correspondence to payers have to generate uh, forms or PDFs um, for the payer and then create cover sheets, have the different faxing mechanisms to all the payers. And you run into this when you, you don't have those connections that ideally would exist with the larger payers in the form of APIs or different connections that would do this electronically. Um, you have that bolus of, of claims and processing um, that, that don't exist in that workflow. And that's where we really find, where we really find ourselves existing in a um, quite a tedious uh, process. And so we actually have automation that goes through a redaction process, um, generates the um, PDF through our EMR, uh, and, and an example for like workers comp, puts the cover sheet on, on top of that, reads the payer information, and then determines where to fax that, preps it up for the end user, they review it, and then they send it on through the fax. So all of that manual preparation and development, um, getting up to that point where we send the correspondence is taken care of through automation. Um, and so that's been really helpful for us. Again, um, you could consider that to be intelligent automation with a, a pinch of AI because you throw in optical character recognition in addition to RPA. Um, and, and that is also uh, a huge time saver. The other point I'll make about that use case is once again, um, when we're looking for these areas to close up, close in on those manual gaps that don't lend themselves to our native opportunities in some of our bigger systems, um, we try to focus on areas where we know we'll revisit in different ways. Maybe it will be a different workflow, but it's a similar document processing manual uh, issue that we're dealing with. Um, and so what we can do is we, we develop those solutions. We go to a very similar workflow in the next case, and re we reuse a lot of those components um, as we go into the the next use case. And so we try to sh shorten our runway um, and, and be smart and agile in the sense that if, if we see a long runway for these types of opportunities, going into that place first and then migrating over to the next use case um, helps us if, if it's in a similar vein. So I'll pause for questions on that one. Again, uh, questions, please raise your hands. And, and and Jared, I always have a few, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, generative a AI, you know, since you're creating correspondence, have you guys looked into adding that to make it a little more personalized? Not yet. Um, we are looking into that. We have been experimenting with it because we have various plugins um, that we can layer in with our automations that can connect with uh, technologies like OpenAI. Um, the EMR that we use mm -hmm. is also coming forward with a few use cases. So they're looking at using generative AI within their tool natively, for example, to help with coding assistance. They're also using it um, in, in, a, in a clinical setting for where they're basically going to, going to be doing ambient listening, transcribing that conversation in an outpatient setting, um, summarizing that information, and then collating it into an after visit summary. So a lot of that, what they call you know pajama time, where you know the the patient sees all of their panels, they come back home at night and they're doing all these after visit summaries to complete their day. Generative AI essentially can take that transcription produce the summary for them. So again, then the person who's typically acting upon that information has now transformed into the person that's just reviewing that summary, editing it as necessary, and then submitting it. Uh, so that's another use case where they're focusing on that as well. I'm there's a third one and I can't think of it, but those are two. Yeah, I've never heard of pajama time, but thank you for that. That was great. <laughs> uh, Rajesh, a uh, question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question I have is that when you're describing the automation in terms of what is that uh, the payer would need, if you, you and I live in a prior auth space, and every payer would need different sets of information for different auth types, right? So 
I'm wondering that, you know, given that information in the EMR in different places to compile, you know, like uh, systems like Epic generates templates and things like that. So have you automated in terms of for this review type, these pairs would require this kind of information. And and one is to automate that. The other is that synthesize that information using any generative AI. How, how far you guys are in that space? I'd say we're at the midpoint. Um, so we, we've started to get to that sweet spot where we, we're summarizing quite a bit to the extent that um, the, the human interacting doesn't have to um, require too much editing. There's still a human in the loop, right? I think ideally right, right. What, we, what we wanna get to is what areas can we automate completely? Um, and I don't think we're we're quite there yet. So I would say we're at the midpoint. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Rajesh. All right, Jared, back to you. So another use case um, that we are currently looking into is um, a lot of the messaging that goes on in our systems. So again, when you look at optimized workflows, there's always more opportunity. Um, and so we're starting to, to look into the, the options. And actually there's a couple of other large scale healthcare organizations that have already done this. Um, and that's in a lot of the clinician uh, messaging. So in addition to, oh, and you know what? That was the third use case, Ed, was um, yeah. provider messaging. So the generative AI use case, in addition to the coding assistance and the after visit summaries, the third one was correspondence. And so they are looking into essentially having patients send in information um, in a correspondence with a provider or a clinician and the generative AI would suggest a response that they could essentially then go edit. Uh, and it's actually similar to the use case I was about to bring up, um, but essentially they would look at the response, again, review it and submit it. One of the things that I've been told and, and that I've been reading about through the experience of some of these pilots is that the generative AI spot, uh, response is actually more amicable as, as it, it's reviewed from a, a patient perspective, they actually think the generative AI response has more empathy injected into it uh, than the typical provider response. So that was an interesting dividend. Um, you know, we're looking at reducing administrative burden, but the Gen AI model actually also gives that flavor of um, empathy or addition of empathy that apparently patients find lacking uh, in, in, in past correspondence. So yeah, very interesting uh, addition to that. Um, the other one that I was talking about that I was going to talk about before I remembered this use case too was um, the messaging. So you have to give responses in systems. Uh, and again, this is what a couple of organizations are doing already uh, that we're uh, researching is you have to give responses to things like normal labs, um, you know, prescription refills, um, all those uh, responses that aren't giving uh, patients um, news that's necessarily going to trigger follow-up or any other type of like specialist referral. It's just saying it's all good. Here's your response. You know, your results are normal. Um, and so th there are a lot of groups looking into those generative, generative AI responses where um, you just get your results. There's a you know th that standard message that they need to generate, but there's actually no um, interaction in some of those responses. Some of them are still supervised, from what I'm understanding, but others um, go straight through uh, as a correspondence to the patient. And so that's another area that uh, that we're looking into. Jira, it's funny you mentioned um, yeah, you know being. You know, nicer in the responses. Uh, my experience at Mayo is I've met some very nice people at Mayo. So uh, except for one person, just just the same. <laughs> I I do have a, a question related to transparency. You know, uh, you know, as people are talking about AI and yeah, you know, a lot of it has to do with decision process, right? Where you want to you want to be transparent about the decisions. Uh, what's your how do I say? Um, what do you follow as far as when you uh, actually are transparent about AI was used here? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, I think what I'm seeing in the industry, it's funny because I was just um, reviewing this with a, um, a fortunate car claim incident <laughs> where I, you know, damaged my car mm. and I took the pictures for an estimate and the estimate came back and there was this little asterisk on the bottom uh, that said we used AI to determine your assessment. Um, so you know that this this particular group is is essentially executing on that. Um, I I think we're doing that we're going through that exercise very similarly in in the healthcare industry, and we have to again because some of those FDA regulations you know you have to indicate that that's happening um, up front, and and I know that is something that we are doing. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of reusability uh, across different applications and what you're doing. I assume it's an API type of an approach where you're, uh, you know, making it, uh, how do I say, uh, available for other apps to use? Yes. yes. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. That was my big question. Any other questions, guys? All right, I, I'm, I'm waiting for my favorite use case. So I'm, I'm uh, oh, here we go. Rob Tennant, you have a question. Yes, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Ed. Hi, hi Jared. Uh, a question, um, is AI uh, being used or can it be used in the admit discharge transfer data feed? So you're, you're getting information from a hospital. You're able to then immediately know you've got to follow up, um, you know, the next day because they're di a diabetic, because there's a lot of data flows. And I wonder if AI can be used in, in that one. My answer to that would be yes. I, I, I know that we have a lot of triggers for that inherent in our system um, to begin with. But I think, you know, again, as, as some of the larger organizations are starting to play with that in the EMRs, uh, you know, Epic, Cerner, um, I think that's layering into that existing functionality. Um, but again, I think it's it's really working towards enhancing what already exists because I know we do have a lot of those triggers um, and those rules set in place um, for best practice in terms of those types of follow-ups. Excellent. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Back to you, Jerry. All right. So I'm going to take a turn here and talk a little bit about natural language processing. And I wanna tell a couple of stories. Um, again, another branch in the family of AI. Um, I've had a lot of experience in the past and also at Mayo Clinic working with um, natural language processing in our intake for patient correspondence through, through our call centers, um, looking at the dialogue of our patients while they're inpatient or in our systems. And we've used a lot of NLP um, historically for doing sentiment analysis, analyzing workflows and categorizing and framing things in the right priority. Um, you know, it, whenever I work with this technology, it's, it's funny because I'll talk to the administrators who are managing these call centers or the different communication mechanisms. And the first report will come out through NLP and it's essentially, well, tell me something I don't know. And the, the objective really isn't to tell you something you don't know, it's to tell you those 10 things that you are aware of that are issues, here's the top one, right? In terms of volume and here's here's the measure of, of sentiment as it relates to that, if it's applicable to the use case. Um, and I'll never forget one of the stories I had. Uh, we, we use this technology quite frequently just to assess what issues are bubbling to the top? What are our patients most concerned about? And when we talk about sentiment, it's not just happy or sad, right? It's a range of emotions, right? People are happy, they're elated, they're fearful, they're anxious, they're angry, um, a whole mix of things, right? And we we pull that into our data and we categorize it appropriately to see what we can action on in, in some of these. And uh, it's it's millions and millions of, of lines of, of data that go into um, categorizing this. So my favorite one to bring up, though, however, was uh, in, in a previous organization, we actually used to uh, record the correspondence of the bedside microphones. 
Um, and I had a dashboard that essentially monitored um, negative sentiment because I always wanted to get up in the morning, get my coffee and see which uh, may have spiked if there's anything that needs to be escalated or addressed. And one really interesting one came up uh, where uh, a mother called in in the uh, newborn uh, ward and basically said, hey, there's this squeaky um, bed going through the hallway uh, and it woke my my child up, my new child up. And because of the rotations of the nurses, they didn't really pick up on the trend, but our data did um, and showed the spike. There were um, numerous new mothers complaining about this. And so we basically called in to the front desk and said, hey, you know, you better get some WD-40 or something and you're waking up all the babies, babies in this ward. But the, I love that message because it touches the patient so close, but it's really a tool, um, again, to help address the most immediate needs, see what's trending to be able to evaluate and correct on some of your workflows. Um, and then also, yeah, look for those, those spikes, um, the ones that you need to address right away versus some of those course corrections that take a little bit longer, so. You know, so interesting about that one, I hope you don't mind if I jump on this, uh, is tone. Uh, you're using NLP to measure or to qual qualify and quantify tone. So are you looking for keywords? Are you looking for cap letters? Or what are you looking for in the NLP to be able to uh, uh, come up with that? Yeah, great question. So essentially what you look at in this technology is person calls in, the call is recorded. We then run that call through a transcription engine, which goes from voice to text. And I think we can see a lot of that, like in Teams messages, where you can create these transcriptions. Um, and then it runs it through a natural language processing model. And it looks in those uh, transcriptions for those key phrases that would equal positive or negative sentiment. And it's kind of interesting because the associations from one word to another could equal negative sentiment, or it could be neutral, depending on how those words are connected and what the order of those words are. Um, and it's also something you have to look at from a cultural standpoint. So great example, I used to live in New Mexico and people say, you know, it's a great day today, no? Um, well, no could be construed as a, a negative sentiment, but in New Mexico culturally, it's just confirming that you agree. It is a nice day today, by the right, way. Right. So in that particular context, we had to adjust our model um, because that wasn't considered negative sentiment. It wasn't um, supposed to be pulled out from that direction, so. Wow, that's very cool. Inflection of tone. Now, if you don't go into your transcription, you kind of lose that though, don't you? If the, right? It's true. And they, yeah. they do have advances in this space now where that tone is more applicable, where they're monitoring these NLP models more real time. And so a lot of a lot of the technology that's out there now um, in Salesforce and um, other tools, they actually monitor these conversations real time so that the agents get these pop-ups and say, hey, you're bombing this call. You're right. You know, what you're saying right now um, is essentially um, not going in the right direction, you know, here are some things yeah, that you could do to, to try and recover. Yeah. You mentioned that at the, at the summer, uh, at the, sorry, at the fall conference, I was blown away by that and, you know, giving suggestions and actually how to uh, change the course of the call and what you could say. I think you mentioned that as well. Absolutely. Wow. Any other, other questions out there? I told everybody how cool you were, Jared. Just saying. <laughs> um, right. This is Rachel, and I. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, I find that I I find this so interesting, but I do have a question because uh, I know what's going on in the industry today with uh, internet-based mm -hmm. APIs and interaction with the patients. And my providers are up on Epic and all that kind of stuff. But I'm wondering where you're going with IP and how you interact with me, the patient, on, on, a, on a basis that's responsible, timely, and gets me going where I need to go. 
Am I making sense, Jared? Absolutely. And when you say IP, I'm assuming like our intellectual, our Mayo intellectual. Yeah, company. and and I and I follow your top guy all the time. I've been following him since he was in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think our our Center for Digital Health first and foremost um, works quite diligently, uh, at least in the Mayo space, to make sure that that journey is is very seamless. Um, you know, that you're carried from end to end in your care. And Mayo has a unique model to begin with, uh, I think, compared to other organizations. Uh, you know, typically when you're coming in uh, to this organization, uh, you're surrounded by a team of specialists uh, who get together, who talk about your case, um, not just maybe specifically in the specialty you came into, but depending on how they evaluate your case, they may call in numerous specialists to discuss, you know, what the outcome would be. But from a digital sense, um, they try to mirror that as well in, you know, our our Connect platform. You know, we do look at what our EMR can offer us in terms of that level, but, you know, Mayo always likes to push beyond those boundaries, right? I, I think our ranking in, in the healthcare industry isn't because we follow best practice, but because we invent it and we continue to push beyond what that best practice is in our research and our testing and our experimenting uh, in that space, so... Great question. All right. Do you have anything else to share, Jared? Or uh, I can. I have some general questions too. But oh, please. Um, so it's it's interesting. Uh, so uh, what prompted me to set a discussion up with uh, Romeo with Emerging Technology uh, Support Group uh, was Vivian Boyd, our your partner right, uh, who's our um, Mayo representative on the Weedy board. And she was so passionate about using AI and RPA to automate a lot of the processes and take a lot of the friction out and make it so much more efficient. Uh, so you, you being in the revenue cycle world, it, it sounds a bit more than revenue cycle. It sounds like there's a lot of patient contact. There's, uh, you know, different kinds of communications that are going on that, you know, besides getting paid. Right, you're, you know, you're, 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 it's a little broader than that, but just focusing on revenue cycle, uh, how, in your estimation, how much of an impact have you made on the true revenue cycle? Uh, are you getting paid faster, more, uh, are you using less expenses in, in getting that done? I'm, I'm curious on how, how, how you've done so far. Yeah, and Vivian has been a great partner, honestly. Uh, we have been flying in tandem for um, you know a, a year plus now, and really have have set the standard, I would say, for the larger Mayo to gain a greater comfort level with this this work that we're doing, and we're inching closer and closer into the clinical practice. But as it relates to revenue cycle, um, we 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 are a, a pretty good standard for you know how we should do uh, this type of work and how we should operate and collaborate with operations. And so, you know, we've, again, used this, this technology to duplicate the work that we pay vendors for and retire multi-million dollar contracts. Um, we are seeing, uh, you know, acceleration in our revenue to our bottom line faster. And, you know, sometimes it's interesting because even, even an extra day makes a difference. And some of our innovations, you know, get those responses back in a way that when we use AI and automation, it is just a day, but when you're looking at the bolus of volume that we have, it's significant uh, yeah. that extra day. Um, and you know, many times it's much more than that, right? We're streamlining those those manual processes, those those touches. Really asking the question on on those manual touches where people need to be involved uh, in in use cases and where they're either supervising. Um, a lot of it started in follow up, so denials follow up. Um, we had. A lot of resources going to portals, you know, checking statuses. Um, sometimes it was a timing issue. Uh, we would basically determine they didn't need to go to the portal at this point. So we were rectifying like workflow opportunities on when the checks were happening. And then when we automated it, we made sure that it followed that process too. Um, and a little bit of the, you know, the, the growing um, and realization of this technology. It's It's a funny thing when the error rate of a human might be like a certain percentage. 
And the bot doesn't eliminate that if we do RPA or if we use intelligent automation. So we use RPA with AI. Maybe our our threshold of of accuracy goes up by twenty percent. And it's it was funny to me that we would have reactions from the business to say, "Well, the bot's still producing errors." I said, "Yeah, but we just increased our accuracy by you know, X amount percent. Are we okay with that, or would we like to stick with what the human was doing?" Um, and so. We look at those use cases too. Now people change their understanding of how to utilize this technology because um, we don't look to fully automate and optimize in a lot of cases. We're, we're looking to say, what can we take out of this workflow as a tedious piece that doesn't need to be monitored? We know after we do that, all these exceptions are gonna be thrown because that's the world we live in. But that's where the specialty from a human perspective should reside. And so people are starting to realize like this technology doesn't change your landscape just from a, a like a functional point of view, but it's a change management aspect of what's the new normal? What's your job going to be now, now that you've taken this away? Um, and, and that's sort of the qualitative portion of this work is we're actually bringing a lot of joy into the workplace, in addition to this ROI, you know, people are being redeployed in into roles and responsibilities, some of which is what they actually signed up for versus what they were doing for the last however long. Uh, and so we are witnessing that opportunity too. Um, and then, you know, creating capacity to explore and advance um, in, in other areas that we've really never worked in before. So our revenue cycle department is, as, as an example, they reinvest into my department, you know, automation and AI. Uh, we typically do that on an agreed upon fashion based on what the outcome was. We get resources to continue our journey um, in, in, in the sense of redeployment. And then there's other redeployment operationally uh, where we're starting to, to create revenue cycle finance concierge level services for different areas of specialty, oncology as an example. Um, and so this is the type of thing that we can do as we elevate our work, as we automate those things that can be automated. And, and again, elevate that level of specialty that people can perform at. So you mentioned the Mayo employees satisfaction. Uh, I, I like. I, I always like to give credit to Charles Steller. You know, we're, we, we're all in this for the patient, right? So how about the patient satisfaction? What, what kind of impact have you seen there? So I think it's it's something probably that was discussed a little bit at, at the conference too, which is, um, you know, you can order all this stuff on Amazon. You're living on your phone, and you can click all these buttons, and 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 magic happens in so many other industries. I think what we've done in terms of creating those similar type solutions slash experiences, that's that's driving satisfaction, right? Especially with certain demographics, because people would expect that everywhere else they go, and then they come into the healthcare domain, and sometimes you kind of rush to a screeching halt. Uh, because that isn't your experience, right? It's totally different. Um, and so I think when we, we look at these different types of technologies, um, and again, if I go to that example of concierge service, um, I'll never forget the NLP example where we optimized a workflow in a particular call line so well that we just took the IVR away. Oh, and I listened to a recording. Oh. Oh. Um after we did that and the person was baffled they called <laughs> and they said hello hi how can i help you oh you're you're a real person oh i don't i don't quite know what to do now <laughs> you know i mean because that's just not what people expect uh right. they don't expect that level of service uh in today's industry right they expect to go through a huge call tree and get to hopefully get to what they need and a lot of times they don't they end up having to talk to a person anyway um but i think those are the dividends that are paid uh, when you invest in this type of, of tech. Oh, great, great example. Um, uh, is that Anna or Arna? Arna. Yes. Hi. And, and hi. hi, Jared. Thanks for doing this. Pleasure seeing you again. Um, would you mind talking just a little bit about your thought process around uh, developing tools internally versus outsourcing to vendor partners and um, like just how Mayo approaches that? I know you've got resources 
that a lot of us don't have. But when do you turn to the industry to solve some of these problems versus developing the, the capabilities in-house? Yes, the, the three-point question, the build, buy, or partner. Um, you know, it, we do a lot of eval on, on the inside um, and agree that we have a very um, robust ecosystem to properly evaluate when we answer one of those three points of, of what direction to go. Um, you know, and, and Mayo is very much a subscriber of, you know, creating a platform ecosystem type strategy versus a pipeline, right? So we're not saying, hey, we're going to go do um, Gen AI, so we'll go pick open AI and that's it, right? We, we like to have more than one horse in the race. We like to create um, a system where we can have multiple groups building upon the capabilities that are out there um, to come up with the best product. And we don't mind doing the healthy competition, you know, with the various aspects of, of Mayo either. Um, if I could use an example, you know, like in the RPA space, um, we've created a lot of our own homegrown solutions, the ones that I've brought up in, in Revenue Cycle. Uh, there are also a lot of companies out there that um, you know, create their own plug and play RPA use cases. And, and some might offer you know, the opportunity to implement and then you know, do a cost sharing model where you know, they would reap some of the benefits of the ROI coming out. Um, we look at that sometimes. You know, I think in, in the coding space, it's a good example too, right? There's a lot of computer assisted coding programs out there, a lot of AI driven coding. I have an RPA team. I wouldn't in my wildest dreams try to compete with solutions like that because they're very well established. Um, creating something of that level of complexity with the team that I have would be uh, quite a daunting task. Um, and so it's also about proper application in that build by partner mentality is how do you round out what those big systems you've invested in don't do and when do you invest with some of those other um, you know, companies that might have already really figured it out? And you can kind of tell based on your experience, it's going to take a lot longer to do it internally than externally. Um, but again, we look at bridging a lot of those gaps too, is every organization, I think the number was like 175, I heard in a recent conversation of technology fragmentation in organizations. And so again, interoperability. You could never imagine or dream that one day your your ecosystem is going to be fully interoperable like that with that level of fragmentation. So how do you address that, right? You have to have good data sets to look at. You have to have a good uh, technology evaluation process to be able to make those right decisions in that type of environment, which most of us you know live in in these large these large companies. Yeah, following up on uh, Arna, is, uh, do you have a follow up or is that is that good? Um, I do. Just there is a follow up that came from that um, around traceability of data and troubleshooting. I I know in an ideal world everything just works, but we don't exist in an ideal world. And how do you think about that? So like the the traceability and troubleshooting part of data exchange, especially as we we have AI in, um, and I, I don't want to pick on generative AI, but it's a it's something that I've just been thinking about a lot as we deploy these solutions across an industry or an ecosystem about um, the amount of effort we take to to go and put out fires that that flare up that we we didn't anticipate in those second and third order consequences. Is that something that is part of that process for you all? And how do you think about that? It is. And I'll talk a little bit about, and I hope this is the appropriate segue. Uh, I'll see if I'm getting to, to this point. I think I think I am. Um, but there, there are also uh, technologies like process mining, communication mining, and task mining. So to your point, where, where are the log jams? Where are the bolus of, of issues in, in these processes that we're trying to implement? And especially, again, back to the point of being in a fragmented technology system, um, you know, investing in, in, first and foremost, solid curated data assets so that you can govern that data in the right way so that it can be applicable to an exercise like process mining. And for those of you unfamiliar with that technology, um, 
a great example for that is um, if you've ever been a part of one of those uh, Lean Six Sigma exercises where there's a thousand post-it notes on the wall, this is the digital version of that. And you, you could go back to those earlier times when someone was in the room helping with that post-it note workflow diagram, which is essentially the manual version of like a big spaghetti diagram. And someone would say, well, how many times, you know, do you fax this document, um, you know, per week? And and someone might say, oh, gosh, I do that all the time, like probably 50 times a week. Well, maybe they said that because they did it 50 times yesterday, but they don't do it at all, you know, uh, typically. And in, in that digital format, when you're ingesting that data, you'll know that answer. Um, you don't have to go through that exercise. You can answer that question. And process mining kind of looks at that from that high level of, of that giant tangled ball of yarn ecosystem but then what you can do is you can zero in on some of those key tasks where, you know, the time is taking a considerable amount. Um, there's a lot of volume coming into certain places. It's sitting there. Um, and I always say process mining is really kind of looking at that huge ecosystem. Task mining is sort of finding that needle in a haystack that process mining identifies for you and putting a microscope under it and saying, what is this? What are they doing? And how can we pull it apart and, and rectify it? Um, it's also a good way to show that if you're trying to create an innovation, that you didn't just automate step three to, to shove the problem down to step 10. With that level of visibility through the data, you can see that. You can see the impact on what it's doing and making sure that you're not just moving the problem, uh, you know, versus solving the problem. So, Ar Arna, you inspired me to ask another question on that same thread. So uh, vendor management. I mean, my gosh, you're doing so much to augment or replace uh, some of your vendor solutions or, you know, you're adding to it. Uh, I imagine you have frequent communications with your vendors and trying to find out where they're going. Uh, and if you do, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so we, if, if I go back to my uh, description of, of Mayo's platform mentality, um, you know, we we don't like to have the the pipeline strategy as, as sort of our main point where we're deciding on a technology plus a vendor. Having said that, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to have strategic partners. Um, you know, we partner with with groups or or companies that are leading in in their in their space. Right, they're the ones pushing the envelope, the top right-hand corner of the Gartner chart. I mean, that's a lot of what our, our, our strategic partners are. Um, and of course, Mayo is, is also very big on um, creating joint partnerships. Um, if, if I could go back to the question, I think from, from Rachel on, on IP, right? We also uh, partner with groups uh, to generate our own uh, solutions, which we can then share with our various networks um, you know, gain royalties from that as we research and, and develop from, from a Mayo perspective. Um, so we're constantly doing that level of evaluation. Um, and, you know, we do it with established companies, but we also do it with a lot of startups. So there's the um, Discovery One in Rochester, Minnesota, which has, you know, you know different uh, companies in that building that we partner with, both in the startup sense um, and, the, and the established company. Uh, they're doing the same thing in, in, in Arizona with that destination medical center called Discovery Oasis. Um, so similar concept is, is to partner with those uh, cutting edge companies, partner with the longstanding strategic partners uh, to develop something new and innovative to share with the healthcare community. Hey Jared, I always promise one question that will give you pause. So here's your question. So, you know, uh, coming from the vendor space, my, my past life, uh, IP and protecting IP uh, is, you know, is, is always a question. You know, how much do you do for the industry? How much do you do for Mayo? So I'd uh, love to understand uh, from a patent perspective, how aggressive is Mayo at uh, pursuing some patents in your area? Or is that something that it's not very active? In revenue cycle, I think we're just seeing the beginnings of that. Okay. Um, it's much more prevalent on the on the clinical side and nice. I mean, we we um 
we see that because of our research shield, right? We're developing a lot of cutting edge technologies, um, uh, medical solutions and things of that nature. But um, I am seeing that also starting to extend on the administrative side. And I think it's largely because of the investment that we've put into uh, teams like mine and and, and others uh, and partners like uh, like we have with uh, with Vivian's team as right. well. Well, I, I've seen patent programs give out bonuses. You deserve a bunch of them. Just yeah. let them know if Weedy says so. <laughs> you've, you've been awesome, Jared. Uh, any last questions to the group? Well, thank you so much for sharing, Jared. Uh, you know, it, it's been, I, I hope many people here that listen to your uh, your presentation can dream how they can affect their organizations and make a difference for people as well. Uh, really nice job. Thanks. Excellent, Excellent session. Always. Excellent session, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks again, Jared. See you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thank you, everyone.